Did you know that next year, the 2000s will be 25 years old? Crazy, huh? Especially to me who is feeling very old and decrepit at such a thought. But yeah, to many people younger than I, the 2000s might as well be ancient history to them. It's old enough that we're having retro throwbacks to it. So by that logic, all the anime made in that decade would constitute as retro, right? When I first began the show back in colonial times, aka 2018, one of the first rules I gave myself was to have a 15 year cutoff date. That meant my original cutoff was 2003 and I was safe from accidentally covering something that most people would see as too recent to cover. But now, 6 years later, that cutoff date has become 2009 and will soon become 2010 the very next year. Pretty scary stuff, right? But time makes fools of us all. All that preamble aside, I think the 2000s era of anime is a ripe decade for being rediscovered, because it seems like an era that's passing out of the collective knowledge. When I was coming of age in the aughts, there were scores of anime titles on everybody's tongues that were considered must-sees, if you were serious about delving deeper into the art form. But thanks to the passage of time, on top of the avalanche of new anime that has come out in the past 15 years, a lot of these titles have vanished from the discourse. Some have withstood Time's Marching Arrow like Osmanga Dayo and Code Geass, and who's to say there aren't more waiting to be rediscovered? But when kids take a look at Haruhi Suzumiya and react with blank stares, the time for a history lesson is nigh. The 2000s is a massively underrated time for anime. While it was the decade where trashy otaku bait anime really plunged its talons into the culture, it was also the decade where TV anime got more experimental, branching out into new areas with new styles of direction. Those are the kinds of anime I wish to tell more people about, showing off the era where anime allowed itself to be more thoughtful, more introspective. And one of those anime is a personal favorite. Thoughts from the heart on a pure spring day My mind floats away on a dream so they say Encore! One more time! A traveler's most important asset is what helps you get back up after a struggle's left you so close to the end. What's that? I know it as luck. The world is not beautiful, therefore it is. This is the doctrine that our eponymous protagonist, Kino, chooses to live by. Kino is a traveler, meaning that she travels across the vast expanses of her fantastical world. She doesn't roam alone though. Her primary mode of transport, a bro superior motorad, is also her friend and closest companion, Hermes. I should also mention that the motorad can talk. I don't like running around with a broken speedometer. It's not interfering with your driving, is it? It's not that kind of problem. I know, just relax. I heard that the next country up the road is extremely advanced. As a traveler, Kino has no real destination. Her mission is to explore and discover as many countries as she can, meet their people, take in their customs, learn about their ways of life. The only rule she's given for her and Hermes is that they can only stay for three days. Yes, three days is just enough time to get a feel for a country. Besides, if we stayed any longer, we wouldn't be able to see as many places. That's true. And there's been only the one where you wanted to stay longer. Even then, we only ended up staying three days. In doing so, Kano can learn all she needs to know about a place and their people, and come away with answers to some very hard questions. Questions like, why do people of this country still go to work when everything's automated? Or, why do they call this old man with no desire in his heart the wisest man? Or, why does this country call itself the land of peace when it's built around the glorification of its own military? This does not look like a peaceful country. 
release as part of the spring 2003 season, Kino's Journey was one of many anime I delved during my journey towards full-blooded otakudom. I distinctly remember buying the DVD box set at Anime Weekend Atlanta 2012, along with my copy of the full series of Lucky Star. Best of both worlds right there. It definitely wasn't the first anime I watched with deep philosophical themes, but it was how it presented itself, its ideas, and its main character that really stayed with me years after my first watch through. What got me to watch this was that this was an anime that came highly recommended back in the day for a multitude of reasons. Now, it feels like you're lucky if this pops up on anybody's what to watch list. This is not just due to time, but also because a lot of the search results for Kino's Journey have been co-opted by the inferior 2017 remake, reboot, whatchamacallit, that dumbed everything down and cast aside the artistry of the original for the light novel adaptation factory style. A true nightmare scenario, but one I can help remedy. I could talk for hours about this 13 episode anime, and I will do exactly that. Well, after I cut it down to a manageable video link. So hop on your motorads, travelers. I'm gonna tell you about the beautiful world of Kino's journey. Welcome, traveler, to the Museum of National History. I shall guide you through time. We begin with the creator of Kino's world, Keiji Sixawa. Born in the Kanagawa Prefecture in 1972, his actual birthday unknown, Sixawa was always driven to become a writer, but he felt that part of his life was going to come later after he spent some time in the rat races, so he didn't submit any works until well after university. The job market straight out of college ended up not manifesting, and while facing down some financial woes, Sixawa came across an ad looking for light novels similar to the then popular Boogie Pop series. Prompted, Sixawa wrote a short story that he had been constructing in his mind palace for 10 years. He then strung it together with a few other short story ideas, with the first story's protagonist as a narrative constant, and submitted it as a full length novel. That would end up being the prototype for Kino no Tabi, or Kino's Journey. His work would eventually catch the eye of an editor, who would then release the novel as Kino's Journey The Beautiful World. Kino's Journey The Light Novel series is the exact premise I described above. They are a collection of 6 to 11 short stories and are also bookended by a prologue and an epilogue that are relayed in reverse chronological order. While most of the stories are told through Kino's point of view, some stories are also told through the point of view of other characters. Characters like Kino's master, an old woman sharpshooter known only as Master, and Shizu, a wandering swordsman who travels with his dog and whom Kino often crosses paths with. After the sequel to the first book was published, Kino's Journey was picked up as a full series around the summer of 2000. It was a huge success for publisher Dengeki Bunko. As of 2020, it has sold around 8.2 million copies. Such popularity would spawn radio dramas, video games, a parody novel where Kino is portrayed as a magical girl written by Sixawa himself, and of course, a TV anime. While they seem to be ubiquitous today, light novel adaptations were still a relatively novel idea in the early aughts. The first success on that front was the monster known as Slayers in the 90s, but producers still saw that as a fluke, especially once an adaptation of a different Kanzak of light novel flopped outright. It's not until the winter of 2000, with the success of the 12 episode Boogie Pop Phantom anime, that producers began to warm up to the idea. But they still had to start slow, no investing for big huge franchise juggernauts just yet. Light novel adaptations were going to be small, single core anime for popular but still low-key stories. Kino's Journey fit the bill. The anime's production would be done by ACGT, with subcontractor studio Studio Wombat acting as the primary animation partner. But the real winner for this anime was the person picked to direct it, Ryutaro Nakamura. A madhouse veteran who joined the industry in the 70s, Nakamura was coming off one of the biggest successes of his career with 1998's Serial Experiments Lane. A landmark anime for both storytelling and technology with how Nakamura and his team used computer imagery in concert with hand-painted cells to produce affecting and unsettling imagery for a science fiction classic. He was, in essence, perfect for bringing Sixawa's beautiful world to life. How did he do? 
One of the big reasons people say it is hard to go back to anime made in the early 2000s is because the transition from cell to digital animation was bumpy. A lot of animators who spent most of their lives training for one tool set immediately had to switch horses mid-race and it really showed in some of the final products. But some, like Nakamura and his team, took to the new computerized tools like Ducks to Water and used the tools to their fullest potential. This is what you really notice with how he does the direction for Kino's journey. There's the way he and his team utilize color filters, a technique that was perfected in Lane. It can allow for so much subtle tweaking of a scene's atmosphere ranging from bright and optimistic to spartan and gray to blue and melancholy. On top of that, there's those scan lines I'm sure many of you have noticed by now. The intent is to create an old-timey effect with the scan lines like you're watching it from an old cathode ray tube television screen, a technology that falls in line with the level of technological advancement of the world itself. It appears to be a broadcast feed from the universe of Kino's Journey. The design work employed in Kino's Journey is intentionally very basic. Characters and settings are mostly kept to simple, recognizable shapes and edges, even the ones with elaborate design schemes but it helps make them more memorable thanks to character designer Shigeyuki Suga and art director Masayoshi Bano. There's beauty in their simplicity, and it also helps make the world feel more like a fantasy world. The animation as a whole feels very artistically driven, if that makes sense. Nakamura is bringing Sigzawa's text to life by making it as visually captivating as possible, even in the moments of gritty, unflinching realism. In pursuit of this mission, he's not afraid to switch up the anime stylings like how the legend of a sad epic poem is relayed to us through a flashback design like illustrations in a fantasy storybook. She then took a knife, cut her own throat, and fell dead before him. Or how an old woman telling Kino how her entire family was killed in a forever war is presented like a series of distorted home movies. Sotos, my second child, went first and was killed. The next day, Dato stepped on a landmine. Then Utos, my eldest son, was killed by friendly fire. My youngest and last child, Yotos, left promising to return alive. He did not keep that promise. And if you're afraid that the concept of Kino's journey sounds boring to you, don't worry. There's still plenty of well-animated action set pieces for you to drool over, especially in the Colosseum episode. <laughs> Sound design, courtesy of Koji Kasamatsu, is also a key component for why Kino's journey works so well. There's non-diegetic sounds, such as this unique bell sound which is used as the perfect period on a scene to signify an important point has been made. What's the most important thing to watch out for during my journey? That's an easy one. Don't kill anybody. There's also diegetic sounds, such as the scene of Kino drawing her 44 single action revolver. It is delivered with such force and power that you don't even need to see the gun when that noise goes off. It's the sound of Kino meaning business. So it seems. The music, composed by Ryo Sakai, is also like the design work in that it's simple to the point of minimalism, but fills the world with such life using a combination of old folk instruments and new synths and strings, which fits the anime's world. I remember one review of this anime describing it as if you're hearing it over the horizon, like it's off in the distance somewhere becoming one with the landscape, so far away yet it wraps you in a soft blanket of melody. Voice acting, both in the original and in the English dub, are incredible. Voicing Kino in the original is actress Ai Maeda. 
not a career voice actress, but an actual film and TV actress. Her best known roles include playing Ayana Hirasaka, the young girl who seeks vengeance against humanity's guardian Gamera in the Heisei trilogy finale, Gamera 3, Revenge of Iris. She also played the main protagonist in the Battle Royale sequel that came out the same year this anime did, and considering the reaction to that film, perhaps it was for the best she had this as a backup. <laughs> Voicing Hermes in the original is Ryuji Aigase, whose only noteworthy voice performance is Colonel McDougal in 1980's Spriggan. In contrast, the dub actually has Hermes played by a woman, namely Cynthia Martinez. Through a voice filter, Martinez gives Hermes this mechanical friendliness mixed with the occasional brattiness that Kino has to gently reprimand. There. Good as new. I'm not good as new. My meter's still broken. I can't fix that. I think maybe a watchmaker will have to take a look at it. It makes him a cute companion, especially when he mixes up popular idioms and phrases. Kino, you should have at least tried the ears on. You know the saying, when in Greece. At any rate... Kino is voiced by Kelly Cousins, who does an amazing job communicating her character. She sounds distant, but not aloof. And there's enough calm warmth in her performance that shows Kino's personal side underneath this seemingly cold exterior. Sorry if I disturbed you earlier. No worries. Your interruption got me out of there. No doubt. His droning put me right to sleep. You slept through the whole thing, Hermes? Till she came in. <laughs> But that's all well and good for how the world is presented. What about how the world is explored? The world of Kino's journey is built upon its premise. It's a vast Pangaea-type continent where countries are spread out with vast stretches of road and wilderness between them. It's a world that allows travelers like Kino to exist in the first place. Each episode is set up like so. Kino and Hermes are traveling to the country, they arrive to said country and find lodging, they learn about that country's gimmick, and after three days they learn there's more to that country's deal than initial viewing would have you believe. Finally, the episode ending with the two leaving to head off to the next country to visit. Kino's three-day rule is important because not only does it give Kino a reason for leaving the country, but also because she can't know everything about a country at first glance. What makes the stories she experienced in the anime so good is that nothing can ever be taken at face value. There's always an extra layer to whatever a country is centered around. One example is that Kino stumbles across a small country that seems very excited to take in travelers and has her participate in a very odd town tradition. This tradition celebrates the cat ear party and all they have done for us. Why don't you try joining us in our traditional festivities? Huh? Would you like to put these on and dance with us? But once she leaves after her three days, the town folk take off their doofy cat ears, dejected that Kino might not have had a good time with them. A little way up the road, Kino comes across a solitary manor where the master of the house tells her about that country. Decades ago, they had deposed the tyrannical king, and in the process, purged themselves of the old traditions to start anew. So they use passing travelers as sounding boards for any new traditions and festival ideas they have. So far, none of them has stuck. But they already have quite a magnificent tradition there, don't they? Yes, but the poor people there don't fully realize that they even have one. And I'm afraid that once they do realize it, their tradition will then of course come to an end. And the man in the mansion? He's the descendant of the Tyrant King. Kino can also visit multiple countries in an episode and sometimes their stories will overlap. In episode 3, Land of Prophecies, Kino arrives in a country who has a cult-like devotion to a book of scripture written by another country, and one of the country's most influential priests who translated the book believes that the world will be ending in two days' time. So Kino has arrived just in time for the apocalypse. You really think the world will end on a night as peaceful as this? It'd be a shame. You know, I don't think there's anyone who knows how or when it's going to end. That's too easy. But once the morning comes, the day after the world was supposed to end, the people of the country are left scratching their heads. 
That is, until another priest comes out with his own translation of the books and says that the first priest merely made an error, and that the real date for the end of the world is 30 years from now. A little while later, Kino is visiting another country whose society is built around the reading of a very long and very sad poem. After hearing the equally sad history of how that poem came to be, Kino learns that the poem was written down into a book, and that book was acquired by a nearby country. That book being the book of scripture the land of prophecies worships. And right when Kino leaves, she sees a platoon of tanks marching towards the land of sadness. A soldier informing Kino that a third priest has made a new interpretation of the book, saying that the country is responsible for the world coming to an end, and that it and its people must be destroyed to save the world. Our only hope is to smash the green plate. And the green plate is... That sad place over there. Seeing that their coastline is curved round and smooth, just like a green plate is. Beyond countries, there's also encounters Kino has on the road between those countries, such as a group of starving traders snowed in in the mountains, or three old men who have been refurbishing, dismantling, and rebuilding the same railroad line for 50 years and are completely unaware of each other's existence. Can I ask how long? A little over 50 years. Whoa! Well, I've only been counting the winters. By some time, how long do you mean? Mm, I'm not too sure exactly, but I'd say about 50 years. How long's forever? I have a guess. Uh, I'd say I've been doing this about 50 years now. There's also the encounters Kino has with other travelers. One of them is a woman named Sika, who makes a big deal about how she and her bodyguard Brock travel unarmed for the sake of better preaching the word of nonviolence. And she chalks up their reason for why they've never been attacked by bandits during their years on the road together as good luck. But it turns out, Brock is such an efficient and quiet killer that he can murder entire armies of marauding bandits in silence without Sika knowing. At this rate, she'll be planting the seeds of nonviolence for a long time. How many lives do you think it'll take to spread the word? <laughs> Sometimes, Kino isn't even the point of view character, like in episode 8, Land of Mages. That episode is told through the viewpoint of a young lady inventor named Nimia. She wishes to build an aircraft, flight not being a global innovation of this world, despite the derision and lack of support she gets from her village peers. Kino is ultimately the one who helps her realize her dream, and she soon wins the respect of her village after a successful test run of her invention. Though the Traveler said it was just coincidence that the stick pointed in this direction and they ended up here, I believe it was destiny. I know that if I never had crossed paths with them, I would have spent my life in disappointment. They'll never know how much I truly appreciate and miss them. And that's the anime, right? Kino going from place to place visiting odd countries and people, right? Not exactly. After all, we should follow Kino's lead and not take what we see at face value. If I could describe Nakamura's overall direction for Kino's journey, the best word I can find would be contemplative. The pace of the anime is slow and meditative. Scenes will linger, go quiet for a few seconds, all in the purpose of allowing you, the audience member, to reflect on what questions the anime is presenting you. After all, if Kino's journey did not want you to reflect on the questions it posed, it wouldn't ask so many of them directly. There's always a deeper meaning behind what Kino's journey presents, right from the first episode. The Land of Visible Pain starts off the anime with Kino entering a very technologically advanced country. It appears to be mostly run by automation, so much so that Kino is able to check herself in no problem even with no people around. That's the strange thing about the country, no people appear to be around. Eventually, she is able to find the country's human residents all living out in spread out suburbs on the town's outskirts, but they all genuinely appear to be afraid of her. It's not until a man comes in close contact with her and realizes that she can't read his mind that she's welcomed into his home warmly. The man explains everything. This was a country of scientific advancements, and after perfecting a completely automated society, the men of science decided to turn inward. They synthesized a potion that would allow people to be able to read each other's thoughts and feelings, and in doing so, would bring each other closer. This being how the man would end up meeting his future wife. Words have their problems. 
often misinterpretation and inadequacy are the largest. Take the word beautiful. It is impossible to fully express how beautiful one feels something is with words. But soon after, they began to realize that they had little in common, and knowing that their partner had no interest in their interest 24-7 was painful and caused their marriage to end. Knowing what other people think all the time eventually ends up dividing the country and forces everyone to live far away from each other for the sake of stability. We eventually realized that knowing the thoughts of others was a horrific thing. Even when you were not in pain, you could still feel the pain of others. Everyone's pain was visible, and that is what drove us over the edge. A tool that was built to bring people together only drove them apart. A morality tale that only gets more prescient with the passage of time and technology. Sigsawa has gone on record saying that he tries to make his themes easy to come across in his writing. His main demographic is high school students, after all. For this reason, some people could call Kino's journey's theming didactic. I don't want to presume anything about Sigsawa's political beliefs, but he strikes me as a right-leaning Schwarzwalder-esque libertarian, someone who's very individualistic and is skeptical of government in all its forms. And the guns. He loves the guns. But it seems that one of his favorite stories to tell are the stories that examine the shortcomings of different rules of law and government. One country Kino encounters is a country that successfully overthrew their tyrannical ruler and switched over to a purely democratic rule by its majority. But because one of the first rules they decided was to put the minority voters to death after each election, they ended up wiping themselves out through multiple state-sponsored executions, until a single remaining resident remains by the time Kino arrives. We ran out of graves, and the decision was made to use the back garden of the royal palace, and eventually, any and everyone opposed to the majority was put down. How many times was the death penalty given? 13,064 times. Not that autocracy fares any better, since the next episode is a two-parter where Kino finds herself forced to participate in a coliseum tournament to win citizenships of the country. And while it seems to be built on a Law of the Jungle philosophy, with the winner earning high status and being able to write their own law, it nevertheless is revealed to just be a way for their insane king to get his bloodthirsty jollies. I've gone mad and taken my country with me. We cannot continue like this. Excess will send us all to hell. So why do you keep indulging yourself with the fights then? Because it's fun! However, I think the story where Sigsawa indulges his beliefs the most is the incredibly meta Land of Books episode. Kino ventures to a land where it is said they have copies of every book in existence, but the only books they allow access to the publics are harmless books that pass a rigorous examination process, while harmful books are locked away in their castle. Only a select few of the greatest critics are allowed in the castle. They are to decide which books from the collection are harmless or harmful. But what if the decisions they make are wrong? Critics don't ever make wrong decisions. That's why we trust them to judge the books. <laughs> Kino ends up falling in with a resistance group of authors, including one who's obviously a stand-in for Sigsawa himself, and she finds herself part of a rescue mission to save the group's comrades. And it is there they discover their brothers in arms have been forced to serve the state as... <laughs> literary critics. The author has still not grasped character development. They're completely one-dimensional. Yes, the pacing is sloppy and there are too many coincidences. The dialogue is short, stilted, and doesn't go anywhere. Oh, the horror. I don't think it is Kino's journey's intention to act as the author's treatise on the world, however. And that's not a cope coming from me, the critic. The morality of Kino's journey is very open-ended. Kino, for the most part, tries to remain passive and non-judgmental in her encounters. She is an impartial observer of the comings and goings of a country, and that grants her a level of safety in more dangerous situations. But also, it's more up to us, the readers, to figure out the answers ourselves. Call it lazy writing if you must, but there are situations where it seems like there is no winning solution, such as the Land of Peace episode. The country Kino visits was once locked in a never-ending war with a neighboring country and had only just achieved peace 15 years ago. How did they achieve that peace? By turning the war into an annual sporting contest. Here's the problem. 
The two armies are not attacking each other directly in the contest, but actually attacking an unrelated third party in the local indigenous tribe who lack the superior weaponry of both countries, and whoever achieves the most number of tribesmen killed is the winner that year. Like any sane person, Kino is appalled by this, but when she tries to broach this with the National History Museum's curator, who was also the architect of the peace plan in the first place, Kino gets shut down with the question, well, do you have a better solution? You see, there must be sacrifice to achieve the peace. And our children have been sacrificed enough already. That's the point. There are no easy solutions in Kino's world, especially once Kino is forced to fight against the tribe's people since they've now resorted to taking their rage out on travelers like her since they can't fight back against their oppressors. We do what we can to satisfy our need for revenge. And unfortunately for you, you just happen to be it. A peace built on the blood of the helpless, who now shed the blood of the other helpless. Kino's journey is an anime meant to be dwelled on. The slow, methodical pacing and gentle tone are so you better absorb the stories and the questions they present. Kino's journey is an anime built for reflection. The answers each person comes away with will always be different. And while this certainly doesn't make the anime very bingeable, it does make it one that you can savor like a fine wine. But don't think for a second that all of Kino's journey is just a series of open-ended questions that we the audience must solve. It does answer one definite thing. Why is Kino a traveler? By the way, traveler, just where are you going? <laughs> The character of Kino herself is also kind of an open-ended mystery. For the first few episodes, we only know that the, her name is Kino, no surname, that she trained under someone called Master, whose only appearance is a 5 second cameo, and that they are a traveler. Even her gender is kept ambiguous. She's androgynous to such a level that there are people in the anime who call her Sir just as much as they call her Miss. In both cases, she doesn't correct them, but she will correct you if you make disrespectful assumptions of both those genders. And besides, she prefers to just be called Kino anyways. Do you think you can find yourself a little weapon? Do you now, a hey, little Kino? Here we go. I asked you not to call me little. Uh, come right this way, Mr. Kino. It's not until the fourth episode, Land of Adults, that we learn about her past. On top of getting confirmation of her gender, we learn that Kino isn't even her real name. That's actually the name of a traveler who stayed at her parents' inn and inspired Kino to become one. Well, hello there, man. My name is Kino, and I'm taking a journey all over. Kino, the original Kino, taught Kino, our Kino, about how there is a whole world out there just waiting to be explored, and that there's greater opportunities than just living in this country where she's expected to become a productive adult when she turns 12. Does being a perfect adult mean you do all the things that you hate? Mm. If they keep doing things they hate, how can they enjoy life at all? Naturally, those ideals do not sit well with either Kino's parents or her countrymen, because becoming a hardworking adult in their country means being lobotomized at age 12, so you'll always do your menial task with a smile on your face and no rebellion in your heart, because that's what good adults do, and anyone who goes against that way of life must be killed. You are defective. After the death of the original Kino, Kino escapes her land on Hermes and takes the name Kino. And that's the hard fact we know about Kino in the past. Kino in the present, meanwhile, is a bit harder to nail down. Your journey's not too much different from his. How so? No purpose and no plan. <laughs> As I said, Kino does try to make herself an impartial observer to all things, only really getting involved if her hand is forced. In her own words, she tries to live consciously, kind and mindful to others, but doesn't seek out glory or heroics. She's just a traveler after all, and that's all she aims to be. But traveling from country to country can't be all that she does. She has to have some end goal in mind. 
The reason why Kino lives by her three day rule is not just because it allows her to fully experience a country, but also because it prevents her from wanting to get comfortable and settling down. Lord knows she does feel the temptation of doing so. In the final episode, A Kind Land examines such temptation when Kino discovers a small country so peaceful and beautiful that she's tempted to bend the rules. She ultimately ends up not doing so, and the reason why is... heartbreaking. Kino doesn't want to settle down because otherwise she would cease to be a traveler, which leads back to the question we started with. Why is Kino a traveler? Remember that mantra I said at the beginning of the video, the world is not beautiful, therefore it is? That's the reason why Kino is a traveler. In her journeys, Kino can come across the absolute worst humanity has to offer, just ugliness upon ugliness in the form of human nature. Sometimes it can be standing naked before her, while other times it can be cruelly unmasked. Despite her young age, it's clear Kino has seen a lot in her travels from the overall world-weary way she carries herself. Sometimes I feel like I may be just some hapless idiot or small-minded person drifting along. Maybe I'm just a horrible and selfish human being. I really don't know what it is, Hermes. Sometimes things just happen. But if there was no ugliness, could beauty even exist? The reason why Kino travels is because the ugliness she encounters on the road only makes the beautiful parts shine all the brighter. After fighting life and limb in a Colosseum deathmatch for the amusement of a psychotic emperor, it only makes the moment where she helps a young inventor successfully test out her flying machine and earn the respect of her town folk so much sweeter. Kino knows not what happens beyond those horizons that she and Hermes will eventually cross, but what she does know is that it's all part of an ever-changing, unique world. And for those moments where everything lines up and becomes a beautiful sight to behold, she can always count on getting to experience those moments. The color of the sky changes depending on the place, the time, season, weather. Each one is perfect, and each one is beautiful. But of all the skies I've seen, I can't tell you which sky is true blue when each one is perfect. There's no such thing, but that's just my opinion. Kino's Journey is one of my all-time favorite anime, and that sentiment has only grown stronger with this rewatch. While it may require you to be on a certain wavelength for you to fully be drawn into the anime's world, once you achieve that wavelength, you get to experience something gorgeous. It's an anime you can meditate on, something that you're meant to let sit with you after each episode. Despite its short length, it's not meant to be a quick journey. It's the anime equivalent of going for a walk and allowing yourself to be alone with your thoughts. Both DVDs and Blu-rays are very easy to come across at reasonable prices, so there's very little stopping you from hopping on a motor ad of your own. Kino's Journey is an adventure meant to be experienced at least once in your lifetime. The journey is the destination after all. Thank you all for watching. If you like this video or want to support this channel, please donate to my Patreon. Each dollar can give you early access to my videos as they come out, as well as keep the channel running a bit more smoothly. You can also subscribe to the channel, ring that bell for notifications, or just like this video. Either way, you'll be helping me out. That's all for now. See you for the next round of tapes. Did you say, know the thoughts? You mean topology, right? That's telepathy. Yeah, that's it.